Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So today uh, we've got the last section in operability looks at process scheduling, and I've asked Tyler to talk about this. Uh, Tyler's, uh, you've met Tyler before the TA for the course. Um, Tyler's in the process systems group in, in the graduate students, and the process systems area is the area that typically does look at batch scheduling. Um, and not just batch scheduling, process scheduling in general. Um, one of the things that I've seen working with companies, an area that you can make a lot of money is by sequencing and planning your process a little bit more efficiently can lead to tremendous gains. So small changes to how you order and sequence the events that take place in your process um, convert over to big dollar figures. We'll look a little bit at this topic in 4G, the optimization course, um, but Tyler's here to give a broad overview of this and Specifically, why we're looking at this is because also for those of you taking 4W, uh, this plays into your 4W uh, course next term. All right. Hey, guys. Um, we have kind of two sets of slides. One slide deck was made by the TA last year. One slide deck was made by me. So we're going to jam them together. So you'll see it kind of transition from one set to the next. So we're talking about scheduling your process. And what that is is you, you start with a narrative about how the process ought to take place. And then you translate that into a schedule. Um, and then you try and make that schedule better. Um, and we'll take a look at that. The reason why you'll make a schedule, the first reason that came to mind for me was that it will tell you uh, what your production rate can be. Um, and it's not necessarily intuitive what that is, but it, so it feeds into your economic analysis. And then it also shines a light on some of the design and operability issues that you'll encounter. Um, and so I guess inherent in any design process would be a point where you'd sit down and make a schedule and then a point where you'd sit down and revise it. So anyways, I've went ahead and made uh, an example that is making pills. It's, uh, it's a pharmaceuticals example, and it, it focuses on a batch reactor. So we're going to here answer the question of what our annual production rate is. And you'll see that it's different from noticing that if, for example, the reactor makes a ton of product a day, then we're not making 365 tons a year. It's going to be an answer different from that. So in the example that I've constructed, my, my narrative was that an operator comes in on day one of the facility and he inspects all the equipment and uh, does, like, cleans it all up nice and does a couple of test runs and then we're ready to go into production. That initial stage won't necessarily, because we don't do it so often, factor into what our production rate will be for the year. But moving forward from that, um, they, they get into the, the production batch. So the first thing the guy will do is uh, pump all the stuff into the reactor and then begin heating the reactor. reactor. As it gets up to uh, the right temperature, the reaction will start to take place and then someone will have come up with some idea of how long we want uh, the stuff to be reacting in the reactor. Uh, then they'll go ahead and cool everything um, so that it can be discharged and then uh, discharge it into an extruder. Um, at that point, it leaves the reactor stage. So all of these steps, I guess, have to take place consecutively and are dependent on one another. But then as it moves into this packaging step, you could be doing any number of things with the reactor, and this packaging step is independent. So it goes into the, into the extruder and then out into some machine that I imagine, I've never seen a pill factory before, but that they're stamping out pills and they go into packages and that's your product, right? So we, we want to devise a schedule for, for, this, uh, for this plant. I, I made it look like this. Has anyone seen a Gantt chart before? Yeah, lots of hands. Okay, so down on the rows we have uh, different activities and as we go across that's time, I guess, evolving into the, into the future. Um, you can see that it follows the steps that we, we just talked about and that I've segregated the packaging aspect 
from the reactor aspect because we can do those in some sense independently. Um, from here, it's obvious that uh, the, from the first batch of the year that we do, uh, I think it's, what is it, 68 hours later, we'll, uh, we'll get our first product out. But that's not, our, um, that's not our cycle time. That's not the time it takes to create one batch once we're up and moving. So we're going to try and plan it out multiple production runs and see, see how that looks. Um, so this is like a first bad guess. This is me, I'm the operator, and I go to the reactor and I start it up. And when I'm done with that, I push it all into the packaging machine. And then when I'm done watching that, and I never sleep because it's 68 hours. Um, when I'm done with the packaging machine, I move over to the reactor and then I, and then I start that up. And uh, then you really do get a 68 hour cycle time and then that would translate into whatever annual production rate that that is. But that's not efficient. So we hire another operator and we're able to make it look like this. Basically what this is, is about 29 hours before the packager is due to be finished, we start the reactor up with a second batch. So that the reactor finishes just as the packager is finished with, with making, the, making the pills so that, that we can fill the packager up again. And what you see is from writing it in this form that the production rate is actually the rate of the rate limiting step. So the packager takes the longest so the reactor doesn't get to do anything while the, while the packager is finishing making pills. And why, uh, why can't we just load up the reactor more? Like while that idle time, just do more batches. It's kind of obvious. Um, because then it won't have anywhere to go. And in the most optimistic uh, sense, it would just, you know, boxes of this uh, like loose product would just build up in the, in the shop floor. And then we'd have to like stop every, you know, two months or whatever and clean out all this excess inventory by putting it through the packager. And so you really can't, you really can't operate any faster than the rate limiting step. And you wouldn't want to. So you can see here that I've outlined then what would be the cycle time, which is 39 hours. So that after we get up and running, we'll make a batch every 39 hours. And that translates into whatever annual production rate that we have. So let's make it slightly harder. Let's say that we have uh, multiple pieces of equipment, potentially, or the potential for multiple pieces of equipment. But that this time we have. Uh, two different products that we're going to make. And we're going to make both products with the same reactor. Um, so here, I guess I'm making yellow pills and purple pills. And uh, the one reaction, it's longer than the other for whatever reason. And uh, you can see that now in this case, neither the packager or the reactor are operating at full capacity. And nor could they because the, it just so happens that the cycle times for each individual step line up so that we have a lot of waste, a lot of sitting around. And I mean, the, the operators might like this, and you'll face this in your career. They like those gaps because they don't have to do anything in those gaps. But uh, from, a, from a revenue perspective, it's money wasted. And so when this is where our scheduling will segue into a design problem, which is that we've given ourselves, in this case, one too few packagers to accomplish the job. So then realizing that we need to install another packager, or at least we need to investigate whether that's the case, we move into our handy MPV analysis. I, I did the lines out in Excel. It's like 5% production loss. So that 5%, and I made up all these numbers, um, we justify it by saying that, say, the second packager is significantly cheaper than the reactor, and that uh, that we can uh, we can get an additional uh, an additional 1.5 million dollars a year from uh, from from filling that production gap. So obviously, our uh, our net present value at 15% uh, internal rate of return is, or I said at 15% MARR is uh, is 6.5 million. And it, it, the gain mostly just arises from utilizing the reactor to its full capacity. So we go ahead and we put in a new packager. And this would be, this is the beginnings of a more complicated schedule of something that you'd see in real life. 
And now we have the reactor, which is the most expensive piece of equipment um, operating at, uh, at full capacity. And uh, the cycle time for this is a little bit more abstract because you have two different products. But, uh, but at, least we're, at least we're producing as much as we can. Anyways, um, looking back on those examples, the idea with chemical engineering in general that you'll face is people are super cheap compared to the equipment. If your reactor costs $25 million and a person costs $70,000 a year, well then don't let labor be the excuse for why your production is falling behind. You want to utilize the people to the best that they can, but you don't want to make sure that you're, you're trying to save money on operators and end up losing a lot on, on revenue. And that also a big theme is to not let any of your, uh, your equipment go idle. I've, uh, I've been in many facilities where they only run during the day, and they've never thought about what they should be doing at night, which is bad. And that overall, uh, our scheduling will be driven by the economics of the process, right? Not necessarily maximizing production, but just maximizing profit. And that one of the things that we didn't consider was that when we make this schedule, it then feeds into another, I guess, operability slash design problem where we need to make sure that our, our steps are as efficient as they can be. So one of those steps was feeding stuff into the reactor, which I suppose just entails uh, the use of a pump. So pumps are really cheap. Buy a second pump, cut that time in half, capture that additional, uh, that additional reactor time, and gain more revenue. And then I guess as a, as a third afterthought and a fourth afterthought is that schedules have to be built to uh, take into account the variance that might arise from uh, like especially human uh, processes, like, um, like someone has to do cleaning or inspection. You have to factor in that sometimes that will be quick, but sometimes that won't be. And that also um, from that, that whatever schedule we devise needs to be realizable by a real operator um, in the context of them getting tired and needing breaks and having to run from one place to the other. Anyways, so these, this, my set of slides, that's not needed. Jam into, uh, jam into Chris's uh, set of slides. So I'm going to skip his first example. But um, his work was, because his work was mostly dealing with uh, mathematical representations of scheduling with the, with the goal of optimizing them, right? Um, he, uh, I guess, made a statement about the definition of scheduling as being uh, the timing of, uh, and, and sequencing of process units in order for that schedule to be feasible. And uh, what feasible means is that it's just like with the operators. Overall, the schedule is, is actually realizable in the real world. So the reactor isn't discharging product halfway through its, uh, its reaction time. E everything is, is actually doable. In a, in a mathematical or in an abstract sense, your schedules can have multiple goals. The, the only real goal uh, is maximizing profit, but there are a number of proxies for maximizing profit um, that can be used to simplify the problem. That way you don't have to worry about how much whatever the product sells for or whatever variables you don't really need to consider. I'll say that most of the time there's only two, that, that two other ones that I see get used. One is the whichever company you're dealing with is so behind and so disorganized that they're satisfied with a schedule that minimizes the lateness of their, uh, of their shipments. So I've worked with, uh, with a company who was perpetually at least you know, two weeks behind on everything on, on services that ought to reasonably take about two weeks to do. So they were frantically focusing on this one much at the expense of their profit. But they couldn't get things together. The only other one uh, is the throughput, which is that if you work in a, like a large chemical plant, uh, the more throughput you can get through that machine, that is a reasonable proxy for the amount of profit you'll make. Anyways, um, 
he goes on to say that scheduling, and I, by this I think he means mathematical scheduling and, and optimized scheduling routines and rethinks of, of existing schedules, have resulted in a lot of successes in the past. And that uh, where I see this mostly is that uh, companies have a lot of inventory hanging around in the event that something goes wrong in their process. They always have that other stuff to back it up so that they can just give them some stuff that's sitting in the yard and then they can fix their problem later and it doesn't impact the customer schedule. With more advanced and better scheduling, what ends up happening is they no longer need that and they can reliably serve their customer's demand kind of just in time. And also to, also to say that uh, while a lot of us tend to think of chemical engineering as being, I guess, you know, A goes to B in a continuously stirred tank reactor, a lot of, uh, a lot of chemical engineering companies out there are just running uh, tiny batch reactors. And uh, they have no interest in going to the, the continuous uh, paradigm. And the reason is because they can't necessarily achieve the scale that would make that economically viable. Or that they have, and more commonly, is that they have very severe regulatory constraints and product quality constraints where they can only have a handle on those things when they do it in a batch fashion. So after the batch, they test it, your pills, make sure there's not much lead or whatever it is that's in there that's bad. And then they can, only release the, they can only release the product to the market with some very detailed report on what the impurities are. Anyways, um, I'm going to get you to go through an example. Easier than the, uh, the previous one we did, or perhaps a lot of the same. Go ahead and come up with a schedule for A, but I want two things. I want after initial startup period, what is the cycle time? And I want what is the time it takes from, from startup to the time that we produce the first batch? Go. And when you've got the answer, just let me know you've got the answer so I know when to jump in. So in order to determine the average cycle time, you're going to have to schedule in more than one, one I guess, iteration of, the, of producing the, the products. So you're, going to have to, you're going to have to schedule in like, like two, two, I guess, batches of, of A.
How many people are still hacking away at it? How many people are not hacking away at it? Okay, more time. Megan, what part are you stuck on? <laughs> okay, we'll go through it. So the first part is easy. How long before or after we start the thing up do we get our first product out? Basically, we start here with the mixer, whatever those cycle times are, and we go all the way down, and 11 and a half hours later, our first product is coming out of the out of the packager. But you see th three more uh, batches going on there. But that there's a lot of idle time. So it's, again, just like the first example, the net rate of production is the production rate of the rate limiting step. So in this instance, and unless I'm looking at it wrong, it's probably limited by the reactor, right? And I. So five hours. Did everyone get that OK? Oh, really? OK. I don't have the slides for that. <laughs> but if you can solve that, then you, I guess you, you do understand the first problem, right? But, does everyone, but I guess everyone sees how, how the schedule is created. Um, they're, they're fine with understanding, interpreting it from that format, and also seeing how the, the rate of production is, is actually just limited by the reactor, since everything's waiting on the reactor, which takes five hours in the case of product A. Cool. Yeah. So in the, in the case of this, we are, um, except the first time, because presumably when you start it up, the packager doesn't have anything to do until it receives the product the first time from the first batch at time zero, right? So see how it has to proceed there through mixer, reactor, separator, and then packager? After that point, actually the packager is running as much as it needs to. Right? So it actually accomplishes its job sooner than the, uh, than the other uh, pieces of equipment do. Right? So it's unlike some other processes where you might have seen that everything is kind of designed to run at kind of the same speed. Right? So in this case, the packager is too good and mostly just sits around. So you, you might even, like, if later you, expa you expand the plant, uh, excuse me, you can. Uh, you can keep just one packager, it seems. And you could probably put a second reactor on there. But uh, you probably need a second separator. And you could probably use the same mixer. With what? Right? So, the, so actually, the mixer has nothing to do. Because if the mixer, if the mixer ran here at, like I'm going to say, like time one hour, I don't know what it really is, where would the thing that it's mixed go? The reactor's busy, right? So it has to wait until, like, I'm going to guess one hour before the reactor's due to start. So it can be ready to discharge the thing that it's mixed into the reactor. And that's why the reactor um, is, is the bottleneck in this case. Cool? 
All right. So, as always, I talk way too fast. So, uh, so all the slides that uh, I thought we may not necessarily go through, we'll uh, we'll maybe go through some of them. How do you want to do this? You want to just go through these slides? One step ahead of the kids, right? Piano lesson? No, no. Um, no, um, so, yeah, I, I think so. so. Okay. I, I have a few points that I'd just like to make. Uh, yeah. Back. Sure. Oh, it's the other way. Okay, so just a point on the, uh, some other details here that this presupposes as well, when you're accelerating your schedule from this earlier version, so that was your base case that you started with, and you're in the same time frame, so as shown here from left to right, in the time frame that you're producing three batches. Okay. If we go to this version now where you're now paying for a second operator, so there's an operating cost that you're adding to this, and you're now going to this, you're able to produce five batches. So you're producing two more batches than you did prior. But it's costing you something. As we always see in these courses, that you don't get something for nothing. So the, the penalty or the price you're paying for that is to pay for another filer to sit there and run the batches for you, a second operator. So you can get two batches out the door more than you did prior. The implicit assumption behind all of this before you go hire a second person to run these batches, is that this extra product that you're going to make, you're actually able to sell it. Okay? It's not always guaranteed that there's a market for that additional product. So that, that's a, pre, a presupposition. The next um, difference that you see going from this earlier version, uh, so Tyler had mentioned that gaps in between these schedules are something that operators love. And we saw that earlier here, so we saw that later on in this plan, and it's called money wasted. And that's, that is true. Operators uh, do like those gaps, but they don't just sit around drinking coffee um, during those times. What, is, what else is going on there? What else might that gap be useful for? Operating their cell phones. So cleanup time absolutely needs to be taken into account. And uh, let's just back up a little bit to the recipe. It, it had this charging here, and part of this charging would be cleanup. So in that time frame, I'm already assuming that cleanup is accounted for. Okay, so at the tail end of this reaction, there's a, sw a small piece of time for cleanup. So that's already been done and, and has to be included for you before you uh, plan this batch out. Preventative maintenance. Yeah. So either of you? Yeah. Yeah. So there, uh, that so there's any like physical change that they need to implement to get going with the one after it. Like going checking and sorting for leaks or anything like that. Checking for leaks, preventative maintenance. Right. So these gaps are useful for that. It means that. If anything did go wrong with the reactor, there might be an hour or two for them to fix it up before they start the next one. Okay? Whereas if you put them right back to back to back like this, what is it that you're going to have to do to be able to run that schedule? This schedule is clearly desirable for making maximum utilization of that packager. Yeah, schedule shutdown. Schedule shutdown, some every month or so, right? Anything else that you'd need to be planned in order to run the equipment this way. You're always planning for like the second batch that you want to do so you can't really have any mistakes because you have mistakes and you like lose a whole batch then. There's no tolerance for mistakes in this schedule, okay? And that's the key the key point is that you have to be able to have equipment that's reliable. So you may plan this schedule, but if your equipment doesn't have that reliability level in order to implement no, no reason for it. Okay, so 
that means you probably have to purchase a packaging device that is a bit more costly, but has got a greater degree of reliability. So you may have to spend upfront capital in order to run this sort of system, or upgrade your existing packager to a state where you can guarantee that level of availability. So essentially, having no great downtime. So that's uh, that, that's some of the stuff that's implicit there. The other uh, part that uh, and Tyler's had some experience with this as well, and we were talking about this when we were planning the classes. The idea of a, a group shutdown just to clean and get started with the, the next batch versus what's called often a deep clean, where the operators in a food processing industry often have to go do an extremely thorough clean periodically. But in between batches, they can often just do a very superficial clean. Especially if you're, um, so a classic example that I've seen, for example, in the food manufacturing is if you're making muffins and you've got an oatmeal muffin, and the following batch is an oatmeal muffin with cranberries. Right? There's no real need to clean the batch out between the oatmeal and then the second batch coming the oatmeal plus cranberries. If you reverse that order, then the cleaning is a very different cycle because oatmeal with cranberries followed by oatmeal, well, you have to make sure you get all those cranberries out. Wow. Oh, I mean that um, frequently you need to challenge the constraints that are put in, and so a lot of times the customer doesn't necessarily care whether their batch is 0.1% cranberries when they buy just oatmeal muffins, right? And so there's, whereas some people would insist that there be a cleaning there, you, you need to examine whether that's something the customer actually demands right. before you go ahead and waste the, re the production time doing it. Right. So yeah. it would be like the idea of running a sequence of batches which have high purity, medium purity, low purity, right? And then the customer does have a demand on that purity level. Right. You have to run the high purity batch first, then the medium purity, then the low purity batch. And before you ro go back up to a medium or a high purity batch, you have to schedule a deep clean. Okay. So that, that sort of additional constraint or additional requirement that comes in the mathematical formulation when you set up these columns. Okay. So when, when dealing with Quaker Oats, for example, is one example I uh, worked with some grad students on this. That, that was a really tough problem to implement mathematically, it was one of the reasons why they had never done it before. Uh, because for them to mathematically represent that constraint was, was a tough issue. They uh, looked at some graduate student research at Max and helped them out with that. Okay. It's not, when you look at a single schedule for a single product, you can sit back and you can often find, simply by visual inspection, what the optimal schedule is. But think of a company that's producing 200 different food products within a one week period. And they've got 10 reactors, three packaging lines, seven mixes, right? So what's the most efficient way to sequence those constrained units to produce all those products in that single time frame? Okay. And that's where it's now beyond the level of you sitting with pieces of paper or an Excel spreadsheet or a Gantt chart. Then you have to go to a mathematical formulation Yeah, there you go. Oh, I don't know. Is there anything? Is there anything left in the lecture? It seems like we no, that's, breezed through it. That's, that's it. Uh, so, where um, what we'll leave then for yourself for reading uh, is where that mathematical formulation comes. It's not something we really plan to address in today's class, but that's here in the notes from slide 21 on it. So, Chris, who was the TA for this course last year, prepared those notes, and there's some references there. I recognize that there's some of you that find this stuff fairly fascinating and will want to investigate this on your own time. So there's a number of references in there to look at that. Yeah. Yeah, so. that yeah. So I don't know how they do <laughs> You no, want to speculate on how they actually do that or do know. Uh, Oh, okay. It's a phenomenally complex program that's being solved it's a mixed integer problem because you're, as a person, are an integer variable. You can't be in two classes at the same time. Right? So you're an integer variable. You're either a 0 or a 1. Um, and then the con what the schedule does is min uh, it minimizes the, the conflicts. Okay? So you, that's why it's still sometimes some of you find that you have conflicts scheduled. But it's the best, it's the least conflicting schedule that's possible. For all students, it's prioritized. So. <laughs> no, for all students.
Excuse me. I bet it, it doesn't. It's also why you see some ridiculous things that you will have one class on this side of campus followed by a class on the other side of campus and then you're back again. It's because the, it, the moment the administrators try to put a constraint in that you minimize movement in addition to minimizing uh, conflict, you can't solve that easily. Or, or it, I guess, becomes a problem that like the sun will explode before we ever figure it out, right? So, so that, that constraint then is simply not added into the system. So that all it's done is minimize conflict. Okay. Yeah. Anything else before we wrap up? Okay, so then just a, a, a word on the midterms. Um, the midterms are finished graded. Um, the only reason why I don't have them to hand back to you today is the final part that takes a little bit of time is uh, into uh, collecting up the collaborative grades with your individual grades, putting that all on a single, uh, to get a single number for your grade. So I'll, I've got that uh, opportunity on, over the weekend, and I will have the midterms back for you on Monday. Yeah.